hello and welcome to the Queen Sophia Spanish Institute. My name is Patrice Degnan and I am delighted to be able to present today a conversation with Maria Eugenia Lozano, who is an academic and lecturer who joined Barnard College's faculty in 2010. Barnard College is part of the Ivy League School, Columbia University here in New York City. Um, Maria Eugenia today is going to provide us some insights with respect to language, linguistics, being a Colombian in the United States and having lived in many different areas of the United States and her experience and insights about learning languages and dual language schools. Previously to Barnard at Columbia, um, she, Maria, also worked at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, Amherst College, Holyoke, Mount Holyoke, uh, Holyoke Community College, and Washington State University. Professor Lothano's research is ample, and it's very much involving secondary language acquisition, language maintenance among immigrants, and technologies for language learning. At Barnard College, Maria teaches beginner, intermediate, and advanced Spanish language courses, including the class Sociolinguistic Aspects of U.S. Spanish. Originally from Cali, Colombia, and a graduate of the University del Valle, Maria received her master's at Washington State University and her PhD at the University of Massachusetts. So I am delighted to have Maria join us. Thank you very much and welcome, Maria. Right now, the, uh, the position of the Spanish language um, it's of such importance in the United States, right? We have more than 40 million people here speaking the language as, as their mother tongue, as their first language. And um, a lot of the students that are going through the um, education system, public school system, they are bringing their Spanish language uh, with them. And some institutions, some schools, some teachers may not be able to recognize and to help them develop those languages. Um, what they ended up doing is uh, lowering their uh, level of Spanish language and bringing more of the English language in and understanding that they are doing better for the students. But the case is, as most uh, researchers uh, find out, is that um, if you have a first language that is strong, that you have a strong basis for your first language, you're able to learn second and third language in a more easier way than if your first language is not solid enough, you're gonna have a hard time learning a second or third language. So there are some schools, like especially here in New York City, who have developed this program that is called the Dual Language Program. I don't know if you're familiar with it, it, but um, this is uh, the most successful program in teaching English language learners uh, where they bring um, ideally 50% of the students in the class have Spanish as their first language, 50% of the students in the class have English as the first language, and then they go through a system where either half of the day is in Spanish and half of the day is in English, or one day is in English, one day is in Spanish, and they don't translate, they just teach in the language. Um, and they don't repeat the same content from Spanish into English the next day, they just move on um, as they will teach in just one language. And that's the method that is proven to be more successful for English language learners in public schools. You mentioned New Jersey. How many um, dual language schools are there in public schools in New Jersey and in New York City? 
Do you well, have any? Um, I, I, I mentioned New York. Um, not, oh. I'm not familiar with New Jersey. Oh, I thought you mentioned New Jersey. Sorry. No, no. in New York, I'm, I'm not sure about how many schools um, have implemented this program. But what I can tell you is that New York is one of the fewer few states who has um, this program. Um, I studied my doctoral degree in Massachusetts. And there, um, the year that I arrived to Massachusetts was 2002. And that year they passed the, uh, the um, um, question number two, which was a law that limited um, the bilingual education in public schools. Um, and throughout the time that I was in Massachusetts, um, all those years, bilingual education was not part of the public schools unless you had a special permission or parents got together and requested that specifically. Um, and it was not until like a few years ago, I would say a couple or three years ago, that then went back and implemented bilingual education after they realized that uh, there were a lot of dropouts um, students in high school. Um, kids were not um, finishing uh, high school. They were not going to college. Um, that's because they were not being serviced. They were not giving services uh, in their um, elementary, middle, and high school. Wow, that's so interesting. So you've seen the tables turn quite a quite a bit since yeah. you. Well, the same happened in California. So California, they restricted bilingual education in 1998. And um, at that time, I think um, there were a lot of studies who were showing that the programs were not successful. And a lot of people were saying like, yeah, my experience is that my child didn't learn English, they didn't learn Spanish, and um, it's, they finished high school and they are not able to, to go into college. And what the research found out was that the people who were teaching in these bilingual schools were people who were not qualified to be teachers. Um, they were just uh, people who spoke Spanish as their first language and they were thrown into a classroom to teach Spanish. Um, and again, like it doesn't matter if you are a monolingual Spanish speakers, uh, you need to know how to teach, especially English language learners. You need to know how to teach Spanish as a first language, as a second language, in order to have a, a good results. Um, so they, they abolished, um, they restricted bilingual education in uh, public schools in California until also a few years ago when they went back again into bilingual programs because they realized it wasn't successful. Now, um, I'd be very interested to know, Maria, um, about your journey as a Colombian woman and find, um, finding your new country, your new home here in the United States, uh, about your professional journey and personal journey. How did you decide on your career as a professor of linguistics and sociolinguistics in, in the Spanish language? Um, Went, were you an early uh, vocation, so to speak? Oh, definitely. Like my parents uh, always talk about me like I was, as a little girl, I always was like playing the teacher. I was, I had my <laughs> stuffed animals playing them as they were my students. But yeah. um, I went through my undergraduate in Colombia. I studied languages. Um, I wanted to teach Spanish, English and French. So the program that I went through in Cali, in the Universidad del Valle, um, it was a program where you get the foundations to be able to teach those three languages. And, and at that time, I was in my last semester at the university, and one of my professors um, came to Spokane, Washington, to do a sabbatical year for a professor who was going to go to Spain to do some research. So my professor from Cali went to Spokane, Washington to teach for a year in uh, Spokane Falls Community College. That was the name of the college. Uh -huh. And when he came back, he said, well, they, um, he posted an announcement saying like, um, Spokane Falls Community College is looking for teaching assistants to help in the Spanish department. 
and my boyfriend at the time applied for that position and he got it and he came and studied for uh, worked for a year at Spokane Falls and then he came back um, I applied for the job because he told me all the great things that he learned and the great experience that he had and the idea was that I was gonna come to the United States and he was gonna go back to Colombia but um, he found a job um, teaching at Whitworth College which is also in Spokane so he went to Colombia, we got married, and then we both came to the United States. Um, I worked at Spoken Falls for a year, and then I found out about uh, master's programs. I always wanted to continue my studies, and there was um, a master's program in Spanish language and language teaching at uh, Washington State University in Pullman, Washington. So we both applied to the program uh, my husband and i we got into the program and we did our yeah. masters in washington state yeah. that is so funny so it was a parallel track in a way well it's been funny we've been together since our undergraduate so we studied the same undergraduate we have worked in almost the same institutions we studied in the same programs so after the masters, we went to uh, we went back to Colombia to teach for a couple of years, and then to Cali. to Cali. We went back to Cali, and we decided that we wanted to um, continue um, studying. So we applied to doctoral programs, and we both got accepted at UMass Amherst in wow. the uh, in the education uh, department there. So we went, and at that time, um, we had two children. So starting, starting a doctoral program with a six-year-old and a brand new baby, it was not easy. No. Um, <laughs> it took me a long time to finish. Um, I, I think I started in 2002. Um, we finished courses by 2000. And for like two years of courses and then um, we took some um, some years off to work and we taught at Smith College and Amherst College and then we decided to come to New York in 2008 and I finished my my doctoral degree in 2015 so it was a long process um, but I think it was it was worth it I, it's an interesting process. What was your dissertation on? It was on language policies in the United States. Um, as I told you, when I arrived to Massachusetts, it was right after the passage of this question number two, which was a, the question that passed, the legislation that passed, that said that um, public schools uh, no longer uh, offer bilingual education programs. And I started um, doing research in schools in Holyoke, Massachusetts and Springfield, Massachusetts. Um, I followed two teachers, um, one kindergarten teacher, one fifth grader, um, and then the kindergarten teacher who was Dominican herself. She, uh, by law, couldn't speak Spanish to her kindergarten students, where were mostly Puerto Rican kids having their first experience in kindergarten and so you can imagine the frustration of this teacher where she was having these kids who were Spanish speakers, first time having a schooling experience and not being able to speak the language that they spoke because she literally could go to jail um, if, she, if she spoke Spanish in the classroom. So what um, ended up doing is that the teacher little by little started bringing the students into the English language and um, I think I want to say she was an excellent teacher because she got the students to the level that they needed to be um, in their in their uh, English language but it was very sad to see the kids losing this language throughout the school year where they were no longer interested in speaking Spanish among them um, they were not doing it spontaneously. They were they switched to English by the end of the school year. So uh, that was my dissertation about. That's very interesting. 
Mm -hmm. I recall when I, I moved to Spain um, with my sons, when one, one of the sons was, I guess he was five, and no, he was three, and he stopped speaking um, because he was speaking English in, the, in his preschool, and then he went, and then there was a learning gap. It's a very, the mind is a very agile, but a very sensitive an organ mm -hmm. definitely and we were like living through that with our own children as well so as i mentioned like when i um, started in uh, 2002 i mm -hmm. had a brand new baby and i was going to these schools in holyoke and Mas and springfield and I was like, we need to finish the program and we need to go back to Colombia. I don't want my child to go through the same experience. I want him to have the right. Spanish language. And the years went by and by, and it was like time for um, like nursery school. Mm. And I was like, oh my goodness, what's gonna happen? And we, I remember vividly like the first parent-teacher meeting, my son was 16 months old. And the teacher told me, um, well, uh, Nico is um, as an English language learner. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? It's like, yeah, Nico, like you don't speak English at home. He's an English language learner. And I said, like, at 17 months, can you tell me which students in this class are not English language learners? Why do you want to label my son at 17 months? And he's like, well, um, and um, I guess you're right. Um, so it was like this constant battle that I think I had to, to pursue in the schools. Um, I remember that was the first experience. After that, he went to kindergarten and the first time I met with the teachers, just like, I don't want you to speak uh, in Spanish to him in the class, in, at home. I just want you to speak in English. Um, the mind can get a little bit confused. And this, I was, like, she was talking to me, I was like, what? It's like, no, the mind is not gonna get confused. Um, he's gonna be able to differentiate the two language codes and he is gonna be able to grow up bilingual. So we're gonna continue speaking Spanish. If you could please continue teaching him in English. And I was like having this battle like constantly with teachers and, mm. and I was like, I, I had the backup of the literature, right? The research, what the research said. But at the same time, I was afraid, like, what if we're making a mistake? What if my son is not going to learn English or Spanish? What, 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 what if, what if? But I think we made the right decision. Um, when we moved in 2008 to New York, he went to first grade in a dual language program. And I think that was the best decision we made uh, because he was learning in English and in Spanish. And by the end of fifth grade, he was uh, proficient in both languages. He was able to read and write in both of them with no problem. And to this day, if you ask him what is his first language, he has a difficult uh, time describing the Adam picking one. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Well, that's very fascinating. It sounds like your vocation is you're kind of speaking truth to your reality and you're almost a social activist in your language. <laughs> <laughs> a little and, bit. Well, I felt that I needed to advocate for my own children, yeah. right? Like if I don't do it, who else is going to oh. do it? And that was literally what I was studying, like language acquisition. And then I have this teacher telling me that his, my son is gonna get confused if I speak one language and they speak at school in a different language. And I was like, no, no, the language, like the mind can differentiate those two different forms of language of speaking and he will be able to, to speak them both. So does Massachusetts still have these restrictive um, you know, rules about um, not offering the dual language program? No, I think they changed that. I want to say like three or four years ago, okay. um, they went back to bilingual education programs. So, yeah. yeah. 
the um, same as California. The only state is Arizona, who still has restrictive bilingual education programs in the in the state. Um, that's the only one. Uh -huh. Well, mm. bravo. Good job, mm. <laughs> Maria. <laughs> and I was wondering in, about so sociolinguistics. And could you um, explain to those of us who don't understand this area of study very well what it is and um, how it's used in in the United States and in the world definitely yeah. well sociolinguistics as if you look at the language at the word itself it's combining two different disciplines the sociology that is the how human people behave and linguistic how the language is structured structured sorry so what we're um what the linguists the sociolinguists uh, do is uh, analyze language through interaction among people so if you think about um, the way the way you speak to your children it's very different from the way you speak at work for example um, the way that I speak to my parents is different from the way that I speak in a classroom. So there are these mediating scenarios where you pick your language, you pick your words, you pick the way you behave, you pick the way you act, and in that way you pick the way you speak. And that, um, that interaction among people is what uh, sociolinguists, sociolinguists study. So in the United States, for example, what we're seeing is that a lot of people who come here um, speak in Spanish, then they find themselves immersed in English language speaking world, right, in the United States. And we wonder, like in the class that Isabel took with me, we look at how those two languages interact among them and what the speaker does with those two languages. So. Um, there is uh, a lot of studies who say that uh, people who um, are monolingual Spanish speakers, they borrow from English language and they produce uh, different, uh, different words uh, combining those two languages. Um, some people call it Spanglish. Um, and I was uh, one reading that we do in our class, um, the class that I teach is um, a reading by um, Ilan Stavans, which is a professor of Spanish in Amherst College. And he, he studies Spanglish. And what he says is that we're living through the uh, origination, through the making of a new language, just the same way as Spanish. It was a Latin that was badly spoken um, we're seeing that um, Spanglish is a new language combining the two languages, English and Spanish. And one day we're going to have a fully developed grammar, fully developed dictionaries, etc., in Spanglish. I don't know if it's true. I don't know if it's going to happen that way. But um, that's what people are saying. Like uh, when there are two languages that are mixed together, that are living together, uh, people get creative and then we have different systems, language systems that can take life and can take a different route of their own. It's interesting um, when you look at certain areas of our new life technology, for instance, how we're communicating today mm -hmm. and um, in Spanish speaking countries, I mean, people are, you know, WhatsApping and email. Yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, I think that that has taken a whole um, other like realm of um, universality and that mm -hmm. it's invaded um, and it's, it's, it fits in, doesn't it? <laughs> Definitely, especially on technology because the United States is the leading world in technology, right? So um, uh, faxing, emailing, chatting, yes. messaging, all of those, Googling, uh, uh -huh. like... Even my, my father, who's 75 years old, he lives in Colombia. Um, so it's like, te voy a mandar un email. Uh, 
de, te voy a mandar un voicemail. Y yo, ok, está bien, papi. Y uh, it's, it's very interesting because we don't have like un mensaje de voz. You could no. say, but it's a translation. And like, we don't say un correo electrónico. Uh, we say an email. It's easier. It's faster. And for right. some, for some people, like uh, we wanna speed up. We wanna be efficient when we communicate. Right. So we don't wanna use these longer words, knowing that we have a shorter one that will make equal sense. Very interesting. And, and mm. what are your current passions right now um, in your field? Mm. Are there any special interests that just excite you or, or that motivate you to say, hey, Queen Sophia Spanish Institute, focus on this. There's an oh. interest here that needs to be discussed, like you talked about with the dual language education. <laughs> What's on your, your plate of um, priorities in lingu linguistics? Well, something that I have in my agenda to be studied um, is um, something that I see like year after year when uh, Isabel and some of my advisees come to class, um, to my office, for example, um, I see that a lot of students who have their, like their educational, not educational, but the background being uh, on a different language. Uh, I have students from not only Spanish speaking countries, but other countries as well. And um, they come to the university and they, they say like, I never had the opportunity to study my language, to study my culture. This is what I wanna study when I come here to this university. And I see it over and over on many students. It doesn't matter the background, it doesn't matter the language. I have a student who, um, um, I forgot, I wanna say she was from India, but um, I don't know, but the, um, the, what her interest story is that she decided to study her parents' language without telling her parents. So she was taking all these language classes. And I, when I asked her, it's like, why do you want to put this? Like, it's, this language isn't going to fit into your major, your minor. And she's like, I'm doing it because I want to surprise my parents. I want to get home after a year of studying and I want to talk to them in my language. And I know they're going to be so ex excited about it. And that, like, I almost cried. It's like, oh my goodness, like you're doing this. For, for your own family, for your culture, for your pride, and for your parents. This is amazing. And I see it over and over. So I Do think- you? But, but all of these very privileged and intellectual people going to an Ivy League university like Barnard. Mm -hmm. My question is, this Indian um, student, why didn't she study this in her native country? Well, as you said, like those are, privileged kids she yeah. went to boarding school in England and then she came to study here at Barnard so she hadn't had the time to live in her country literally but she knew her culture he knew her parents she knew a little bit about the language but she never studied it interesting yeah. wow so I think that this is something that I would like to pursue someday um, like finding your own identity, your own culture through the first language or through your background language, to your parents' language. And how can we as instructor um, help students develop not only academically, but also um, emotionally? Yes, because what it is is a leap of um, faith in being really multicultural in the deepest sense. And that comes with embracing all aspects of culture. Sometimes it's not even your own. Today, it was funny. Mm -hmm. I had to do a, a, an errand and I was talking to this gentleman. I was I'm moving from New York City with my apartment. And he said, I told him about my job. He said, so you're American and you're Spanish. I said, yes. And I wasn't born in Spain. I have no blood, but it's, it's embracing it and saying, yes, it's me. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be a bloodline. Sometimes it just can be a love and enthusiasm. 
Definitely, definitely, yeah. yeah. And, and as a professor in the Spanish language, what is your perspective on the importance of learning Spanish in the United States? Oh, I think right now I see it more as a political reason, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we're living through an era right now that um, literally, like in recent years, I double check before I speak Spanish on the street. And this is something that never happened to me. I've been living in the United States for 23 years. And this is the first time that I feel really? afraid of speaking Spanish really? outside of my house, outside of a building. Yes. Um, I, I haven't had an experience, um, a bad experience about it, but I, I see the reaction of people. I see the way they look at you when you're speaking a different language in the subway, for example. And I feel afraid. So I think right now, um, immigrants are not going to leave. Um, the immigrants are going to be here to stay. And for me, speaking Spanish, maintaining, maintaining the Spanish language um, is something that it's, it goes beyond your identity, it goes beyond your background. It's more of a political stance. Wow. Interesting. Mm -hmm. and, and with respect to different Spanish, how is Mexican Spanish in the U United States different mm -hmm. from Cuban Spanish in the United mm -hmm. States, Puerto Rican Spanish in the United States, mm -hmm. or Dominican Spanish? Oh, it's so different, so different. Like, I can be listening. Um, when I go uh, to get my hair done, it's a Dominican woman. And I can literally stay there for half an hour and not have a clue what they are talking about <laughs> among them. Like I could understand a few words, few things, but the way they speak, it's so fast. And the words that they use, and it's like, I don't know what they're talking. Is it close? And like talking, like, what are they talking about? Um, I think um, it is... Um, like, um, I like, there is a professor who retired at NYU, uh, Otegi, and he said that we, we need to talk about the Spanish in the United States as, as that, like Spanish of the United States, which is different from Spanish from Mexico, Spanish from Spain, Spanish from Colombia, like Spanish from the United States has its own language, idioms, mm -hmm. And this is the way we need to treat it. He doesn't like the word Spanglish. He says that it's diminishing. Um, but like the way people speak Spanish in the United States is very different from the way um, they speak in other parts of the United States. Like starting with the word Latino, for example. Um, if you say, a, like in Colombia, for example, and you say like, oh, I'm Latina, like they wouldn't understand what I want to say. Um, so it's only, it's that word that is used to describe people from Spanish speaking countries in the United States. That so what would you use in Colombia? What word would you use in Colombia not Latina? Soy Colombiana. Yeah, I'm Colombian. Um, like I don't, there's no, not a word that will summarize, like I come from a Spanish speaking country. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't describe it that way. So I'm from Colombia. But I will say, going back to your question, um, Spanish from Mexico, because of their its own idioms, its own idioms, uh, it's, it's very different. Um, um, I'm, right now, I'm chatting with a friend who's from, um, a, from, I want to say, oh my goodness, Barcelona, and the she's right now um, battling with cancer, and her birthday was yesterday. And uh -huh. I sent her a card, and um, I use a word that we use in Colombia, Spanish, and I said like, you're the most like hardworking woman um, that I ever met. Like you're so brave. 
uh, but I use that word in Colombian Spanish, which is berraca. What is it? Um, berraca, berraca, yeah. like a, like a strong, willing person. Uh, es una berraca. And then she's just like, oh, I have to look up that word. I didn't know what it meant. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, I, I knew that. I knew that you were going to look it up. Yeah. Um, but that's what I wanted to to meant uh, to her. Mm -hmm. But there's mm -hmm. like a lot of words that you can, you don't find that you don't understand from one country to the other oh. one. So it's, it's very interesting. And I, it, I really it, like that. I enjoy those differences and asking the question and where is that word coming from and all of those things. That, those are things that I enjoy learning about. Well, that's wonderful. That's, that's an amazing mm -hmm. gift that you're, you're sharing with us. And I guess as a last question, um, what projects are you working on currently that you can share with us, uh, Maria? Well, literally right now, what I'm worried about is uh, my classes in the fall. Um, yeah. We're moving online due to the pandemic. So I spent the whole summer, the end of May, all June and I was in a symposium last week as well learning new tools how can I teach language online and I know there are some places who have done it for many years but in my case um, last semester the second part of the semester was my first time teaching online and I don't feel secure I'm not sure about how to move the content from a face-to-face -face into an online platform. So um, what, the, what I'm doing right now is trying to learn um, new elements, new sources, new platforms, new uh, uh, ways of teaching online because chances are we're going to be teaching online in the fall. Wow, you're not going to have any classes at all, physical classes? Well, the university gave us a choice. Um, they asked us if there, there, was, there are three options. We could teach online, we could teach a hybrid class, which we'll meet sometimes in face-to-face, -face, sometimes online, or teach face-to-face 100% -face of the time. Um, but right now, for me, it's, um, I cannot make that decision, I don't know. Uh, what's gonna happen. Ideally, I would love to go back to the classroom. I would love to teach my students face to face because I believe that that's the most effective way outside of living in the country which language you're studying. Um, but having the interaction like face to face is um, it's an easier way to learn the language than doing it through the online platform where there are so many distractions. They have the chat going on. They, they can't just space out because there is not a lot of engagement if you don't do it constantly. Um, but at the same time, I don't feel that I, I can go to the classroom and feel safe and feel that my life is not in danger. So, exactly. Also, you're a steward of other people and you want to set a good example, of course. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. I must say, though, I lived in Spain for over 30 years and I'll never forget, you know, that um, Spaniards from all those years always said, guess who has el mejor acento de todo <laughs> <laughs> la población hispanohablante the colombians the colombians ah, <laughs> oh okay you're you're honey <laughs> yes i don't it's know very where well that, recognized yeah. in Spain. Yeah. i don't know where that came from but yeah no. i've heard it before also saying people like uh, especially from bogota people from bogota have said most beautiful Spanish. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> really? I thought it was Cali. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't know about that. <laughs> well, well, I think that this has been like so interesting and very um, informative. And I'm really happy to, to understand a little bit more about your area and how tied it is to being a Spanish language teacher as well. I, I didn't know if it was a a, a, a sector onto itself, but I see it's intrinsically tied into 
your role as an academic professor of, of the Spanish language too. Yeah. 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 And your love of the English as a second language is so is so important, and um, because you know we I, I think we need to all really help the immigrants who are coming in to feel proud of of their country of origin. That's what we do in our institute through the Hispanic mm -hmm. Society, sharing maps and globes and a better understanding of where we came from and and the, the, the positive influences of um, the Spanish speaking world in the United States. Definitely, if they are not proud of their own origins, it's very difficult to take pride in other things as well. Exactly, exactly. It's what makes us yeah. ourselves, our, our true authentic um, beings, so bravo. <laughs> no, thank you very much for having me.